everybody please rise and welcome the City of Brockton's clergy into the sanctuary, led by Reverend Joe Wiley. on behalf of all of us. On January 19, 1997, 
We gather together for the first time as a solid, united community, hoping to continue remembering the life and spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Today is no different. When we started, the program was in two parts. The major part of the program was at 479 Tory Street with a luncheon, speeches, music, and the keynote speaker. <coughs> we then did a symbolic motorcade. It was too cold, actually, to march to 80 Legion Parkway for more spiritual programs. So, after 19 years of hosting the event at Temple Beth Amuna, we are today at this beautiful building in downtown Brockton. Soon I will introduce my co-chair of today's program, Reverend Jill Wiley, who will be our host today. We thank you, Jill, for all your hard work. <coughs> 20 years ago, Rabbi Warp gathered the clergy of the city together at Temple Beth Amuna and set the groundwork for what we have followed with minor adjustments for 20 years. Rabbi Warb received a letter from Pastor Walker within the week of the first program. I would like to read an excerpt from that letter, which sums up the reasons for this program. I don't think there was emails back then. So this is <laughs> actually on the side of the station of hand typed on a typewriter. So I'm just going to give out one sentence that I thought was very important for today's event. Reverend Walker called our program a microcosm of Dr. King's dream. Black and white, rich and poor, Jew and Gentile, getting together to celebrate, and this is in quotes, he quoted this, what ought to be. So today, ought to be. A few years ago, I decided to dedicate this program in honor of someone who is no longer with us. Even though I am excited about this program continuing here at 80 Legion Parkway, a piece of this program is missing in my heart. Many of you, whether you are Jewish or not, remember 479 Torrey Street and all the good things that happened there for all of us. Temple Beth Moon will continue to flourish in the future, but I felt it would be wrong not to remember that beautiful building up on the west side. With these thoughts in mind, Today's program is dedicated to our beloved former home at 479 Torrey Street. As I have mentioned, Rabbi H. David Warb was instrumental in getting this program going and being a major part. Since his retirement in 2007, I have read a letter that he always takes the time to write to us. And I'd like to read that letter now. Dear friends, warm greetings from sunny Florida. As I write to you this year, we all realize that we live in perilous times. Black Lives Matter is not just a slogan. It is a reality in the face of the many terrible, senseless killings of black youths in our country recently. We can amplify this to read all lives matter when we take into consideration the horrible loss of life per perpetrated by terrorists in this country, Paris, Israel, and around the world. Our Jewish sacred literature teaches us that he who takes one life is as if he has destroyed the entire world, and he who saves one life is as if he has saved the entire world. Our job as religious people is to save lives, not destroy them. As godly people, our job is to work for the good of all human beings, regardless of their race, gender, or religion. This is what Dr. King taught us when he said, we have flown the air like birds and swarmed the seas like fishes, and have yet to learn the simple act of walking the earth like brothers. Our gathering today and over the years has helped us to see each other as brothers and sisters and to treat each other in a godly manner. May God's dreams be fulfilled as may God's dreams be fulfilled and may his words guide us as we all work together to create a better world for us and our families. With love, Rabbi David Warren. Amen. One comment. Black lives do matter. Soon you will hear from Steve Bernard, 
from the NAACP who is involved in a program that helps to save lives. It is my honor now to turn the program over to Reverend Jill Wiley. I want to thank her for her immense hard work putting this program together with me. Jill. Thank you, Steve, and thanks to all of you for being here and joining on this special occasion. It's, um, in some ways, it's a spiritual act, and one where we, we wanted to assist uh, Temple Beth Immune in making a transition from the old to the new and to provide a home for that to happen. And uh, so today, as we think about the past and uh, 19 rich years, and we welcome the 20th annual speaker, a very auspicious <laughs> time for us, that we look into the future. And you've heard the term, it takes a village. And often we think of place as a village. But I tend to think that it's a time. And so we have a group here that would probably be a good village. And so for the time together that we are here this afternoon, we are a village. And so we can share and we can lift each other up and also um, be able to nurture one another as we've been nurtured. And we thank all those who have contributed to the wonderful meal today. So a great welcome. And the one thing I adhere to as a, as a pastor and a minister and a worship leader is that uh, the opening prayer can come anytime. So if, if, the, if Reverend John Page is here, we'll have that opening prayer, but I have put out my feelers and it doesn't sound like he might be here yet. So we will be blessed when his presence comes, but we are blessed simply by being a village here together. And uh, we have a series of greetings, as you can see, and uh, as we uh, note those, each of you can come forward and, uh, and speak from the uh, pulpit here. And uh, my first act is to introduce Michael Wayne Walker, who, to use a very cliche, cliche extract, needs no introduction, but I would like to say that he is one thing, <laughs> I won't prolong things, but I determined that he is the one traditional existentialist postmodern, <laughs> biblically apocryphal based minister, maybe around. So I Greetings to our co hosts. Thank you so very much to Brother Steve Weiner, to Reverend Jill Wiley. And on behalf of the two of them, I would like to welcome, and the congregation, I welcome all of you to Temple Beth Amuna today. <laughs> welcome to the temple at 80 Legion Parkway. <laughs> Thank you all very much for being here today. We really are honored by your presence, by the, by the meal, by the, and not just your presence here today but by your presence in this community and what you are and what you do in this community. One of my, um, one of my sheroes, Audre Lorde, says that it is not the destiny of black America to repeat white America's mistakes, but we will if we mistake the trappings of success in a sick society as the signs of a meaningful life. Part of being true to ourselves, true to our destiny and who we are, and I really encourage, I'm so, so happy to have our speaker with us today, the Reverend Irene Monroe, and I think literally between here and the door, I heard at least 19 times I listen to her every Monday on the radio. <laughs> Egan and Brownie, so welcome today. We not only get to uh, hear her on the radio, but we get to see her at Temple Beth Amunda, of course. <laughs> so welcome today. I'm so thankful that she's here. I really encourage you to, to if you like YouTubing, YouTube a, uh, a Martin Luther King Jr. sermon. And it's his sermon, Paul's Letter to American Christians. And it was, it was, one of the, it was a, a letter that Paul wrote um, 
and he writes it just as many of the uh, of, of the Second Testament uh, God letters. He writes it as a letter to American Christians. In that letter to American Christians, one of the things King says, uh, in, in, in keeping with the Audre Lorde sentiment, is that capitalism is not working for the vast majority of people. Not only is it not working for black people, it's not working for people. King, you remember, had gone to, had gone to Sweden to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. And while he was there, he was, he was touched and impressed with what, what he began calling later in his life, which probably was signing his own, own death sentence uh, when he started announcing it. He started calling it a, the middle way and said that we must now seek the middle way. And that middle way for him was, was, was the middle way between communism and capitalism. And it was, he says, in his words, rejecting all the worst elements of communism and rejecting the worst elements of capitalism <coughs> and embracing the best of capitalism and the best of communism and finding the middle way that seeks a humanity and works and upholds the humanity of all people and to constantly ask, how can we be more human and how can we be more humane? In that spirit, being humane and human, welcome to the temple today. Pleasure to welcome Rabbi Alana Foss to Brockton a few years ago, and it's a pleasure to welcome her now. Good afternoon. Hine Matov Omanain, how good it is to sit with our brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for welcoming me and Temple Bethlehemina the Messiah Baptist. <laughs> we, can have, we can have a, a, a dual identity <laughs> uh, here for this special day. Inevitably, at this time of year, there are assessments of Dr. Martin Luther King's legacy. What did he do, and what is there left to do? Dr. King understood that he would leave the work unfinished that arriving in the promised land of equality would not be part of his lifetime. As he wrote, we are greatly misled if we think the struggle will only be by prayer. Prayer is a marvelous and necessary supplement for our feeble efforts, but it's a dangerous substitute. When Moses strove to lead the Israelites to the promised land, God made it clear that he would not do for them what they could do for themselves. Deep belief was an aid to action, it was never a substitute. A visionary also needed a companion, someone who would act and implement. The Talmud, the Jewish code of law, says there's a curious exchange between Moses and Joshua, as Joshua is about to take over uh, for uh, take over Moses' leadership. It cites Numbers 11, 28, when Eldad and Medad are causing trouble in the camp. Joshua asked Moses, my Lord, Moses, restrain them. Perhaps Joshua is worried on Moses' account or about his own role that he is about to take the role of prophet. But in the Talmud, it says, the rabbi suggests that Joshua actually meant throw on them the cares of the community and they will, a matter of, they will as a matter of course, stop prophesying. <coughs> There's two more. Once you actually have to do the work, you can't be a prophet anymore. Whether the sentiment is more Moses or more of Joshua, thinking, as the Talmud suggests, it reinforces the idea that Moses was torn between serving as a prophet and dealing with all the communal needs. Joshua will later take on this mantle and perhaps weighed down by the burdens of conquering the land, never really functions as a prophet. He takes what Moses has given him, a struggling people, and strives to implement the vision of his ancestors. The past year has been filled with tremendous social upheaval 
as around the country and around our city. We're examining relationships with the police and with overwhelming amounts of gun violence. As discussions about race and power in our society continue, we have a vision for what we know needs to improve, but we're still struggling individually and collectively as a society to take things further. How to implement the justice and love that our country deeply needs. Our entire country must confront the reality that black and brown people are treated different in our society. Where do we go from here? The story continues to the promised land. The issues of justice and equality are ever present. Our American community will not reach a promised land until everyone is treated with fairness, dignity, and respect. We are the Joshua generation. Moses took on the Exodus. Dr. King took on civil rights. Now it's our time to stand up to injustice, to care about the lives of black and brown people, to find ways to make our country a more just and peaceful place if we're ever to truly enter the promised land of justice, safety, equality, and peace. We must hold aloft the banner and get to work. The theme for this program today is shining a light. And so one of the brightest lights in Brockton is our mayor. So we invite him to share his wisdom with us today. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Pastor Wiley and Pastor Walker. It's wonderful to be back here. I feel very at home here. I've spent a lot of time here over the last few years. And uh, in both of my inaugurations, Pastor Walker has given the invocation, and that's by design, not by accident. So, without getting the other clergy mad at me, he is one of my favorites. Um, but welcome to all the clergy here, and uh, Rabbi Foss especially. Um, I think it's important, what we're, part of what we're seeing here today is although the, the home and the name of the congregation uh, from Temple Beth the Moon may have changed, uh, I think the commitment of the members of the temple to the city of Brockton has not changed, and that's what we see here today. <laughs> So I did, and I'll be really brief on this point, but for those of you that weren't with us uh, at the breakfast yesterday, uh, first of all, we'd like to know why you weren't with us at the <laughs> breakfast yesterday. But beyond that, um, I, I did announce uh, that as a continuation of a conversation uh, between myself and the NAACP uh, that began in November, uh, that we are immediately reinstating the city's diversity commission that has been dormant for about five or six years, and that on Tuesday I'll be sending up 11 nominations to the city council for individuals to sit on that diversity commission. And I'll, I'm going to challenge them, and uh, they'll challenge me, and as I mentioned yesterday, if it, uh, if it works the way it's supposed to, we'll all have some very uncomfortable conversations Absolutely. because that's the only way things change. Um, I, I did bring just a, a couple of MLK quotes with me the, this afternoon, and I do appreciate the rabbi referencing the issue of gun violence because right now in our city, you know, the two biggest challenges facing us are gun violence and drug addiction. And we've got to be willing to say it out loud, face it, and work together um, to deal with it and start saving lives. And both issues are just important as each other, and unfortunately they cross over with each other now. Um, so as I think about the work of the Diversity Commission and on a weekend that we celebrate the life and the work of Dr. King, um, I want to read uh, the first MLK quote that I think is very applicable to our situation, and that is, 
Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. What, and, and this is where our city finds itself today. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And we need a commitment from all of us uh, to care about all of the issues facing the city, whether they affect us directly or indirectly. So whether that's helping us to work with the young people, the young adults growing up in the city, um, to make sure that uh, they have opportunities to look forward to and we can help them strengthen their decision making, to make good decisions about their future, that's all of our responsibility. And when we see someone that's struggling with addiction, that's all of our responsibility. Um, over the past four days, uh, we have experienced 45 drug overdoses in this city. In the past four days, we have responded to 45 overdoses, 45 Narcan saves in four days. And our first responders are doing a tremendous job. We have not lost one life in those four days. But the reality is that during 2015, we lost 123 lives in this city to drug overdoses. And a little more than half of those folks were not brought to residence. So again, what affects us directly or indirectly, it, this is a crisis that is facing all of us. And the one I have really focused on recently, and I'm gonna ask Pastor to help me with this one because uh, it's Dr. King referencing scripture in one of his writings. The pastor may be a little stronger at this than I am. Um, but he wrote, the first question which the priest and the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the Good Samaritan reversed the question and said, if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? And was that close enough, Pastor? All right, all right. But I mean, those words are as true in the city today as they were when they were written, as they were when Dr. King referenced them. And, you know, as we embark on facing these challenges that we face, uh, this city, we all need more Good Samaritans. And I hope in the spirit of Dr. King's life, you'll join us and, and be a Good Samaritan and help us take these issues head on. Thank you. Gracious God, thank you for calling us here together today to be of one heart as we share this occasion. And we remember heroes. We also remember those who have been victims of a society that push, pushes them to the margins. And so we hear in those words, families of victims, families of those trying to care for those who have had overdoses, for the care workers, all of those, we ask that you embrace them in a, a cloud and a, the wings of healing. We also ask that, that as we pray for this city, that 2016 will be 
ways forward into new paths that you've carved for us, and that we can take the wisdom that we receive today from all of those who offer their best into our lives so that in each case and in each life, we can shine our light in all places and in all times. This we pray today together. Amen. The support that uh, has come to this event through the years has come from many places, as you can see and know. And uh, Eastern Bank has been a supporter for since 2010. And so we greet Nelia, who's going to come and speak uh, and offer words from Eastern Bank. honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., an individual who sought equality and fairness in all people. Years after his passing, his spirit lives on through all of us who continue to pursue his goals. From the very beginning, Eastern Bank's mission has been to provide much needed help to our communities. We were founded in Salem, Massachusetts in 1818 to serve people of modest needs we did not have access to, bank, to the banking system. We are now based out of Boston. We are the largest and old, oldest mutually owned bank in the country with over $9.5 billion in assets with more than 100 branches serving communities in Eastern Mass, Southern, and the coastal New Hampshire state. Eastern Bank offers banking, investments, insurance, all under one roof and prides itself in working harder to understand our customers' needs so we can deliver these services in a committed and personal way. At Eastern Bank, we practice the basic principles of corporate social responsibility for almost 200 years. We pride ourselves on being true to our employees by offering tremendous opportunities for individual growth. As an exclusive and inclusive company, we work to ensure that our valued employees are treated fairly, recognized for their individualities, and encouraged to reach their fullest potential. We are very proud to be recognized in the Boston Gold's top places to work for seven consecutive years. We are also placed in the top 100 in the National Survey of Workplace Dynamics of top workplaces in the United States. And we are equally honored to be recognized by the Human right, uh, Rights Campaign as one of the best places to work in an inclusive environment. Over the past 196 years, our mission has expanded to charitable giving, social justice, and protecting the environment. Those efforts and more are part of our community strategy, which resonates with four pillars that we are very proud of to pursue the Eastern Bank Charitable Foundation, volunteerism, leadership, and advocacy. Since 1999, we have contributed 10% of the annual net income, that's nearly seven times the national corporate median, to charitable endeavors, totaling more than $60 million in the past decade. In 2015, Eastern Bank's Charitable Foundation has donated more than $6 million to over 1,500 nonprofit organizations across Massachusetts. Each year, the trustees of our foundation identify a featured category of giving, an area where the bank focuses for community initiatives and raise awarenesses for others. In 2015, our focus was violence prevention. In 2016, we are focusing on strengthening families. Eastern Bank takes its role in the New England community very seriously. We feel a great responsibility to advocate for principles such as fairness, honesty, and justice for improved society. Our support goes beyond dollars. At last count, Eastern Bank employees donated more than 40,000 hours to organizations as volunteers. They can be found swinging hammers at Habitat for Humanity building site, painting walls at a local Boys and Girls Club, or discussing strategic planning ideas as a board member of many organizations. We demonstrate our leadership in the community in a variety of ways. We recognize leaders in a community who make a difference. We also lead by example from implementing programs to help save the environment, advocating for those in need. But today it's not about Eastern Bank, or you, or me. 
It's about the joyous celebration of one of our nation's greatest leaders, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Let me leave you here today with a quote from one of Dr. King's most inspirational speeches on August 28, 1963, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. I still have a dream, a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. One day this nation will rise up and live up to its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream. Let us all continue to fulfill this dream today. Thank you. Thank you. We'll welcome David Singer to represent the New England Federation, Reformed the Federation Jewish Men's Club. And following that, Steve Bernard can make his way. Hello, uh, the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs is an arm of the United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism, which is kind of akin to the American Baptist Association view. The Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs is, is the international umbrella organization for a confederation of more than 250 men's clubs serving 25,000 men throughout the United States and Canada. The New England region alone consists of 17 clubs and about 1,400 members. Our mission is to involve Jewish men in Jewish life. And we do that through leadership, innovation, and community. The Temple Israel, Tem Temple Amuna, Beth Amuna, and now Temple Beth Am men's clubs exemplify these values in holding this Martin Luther King Day celebration every year. These clubs have shown strong leadership running the, this innovative program for more than 20 years and they have built community both within the Jewish community and within the community at large. One of the signature programs of the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs is our Yellow Candle Program. The program involves supplying yellow candles for people to light in their homes on Yom HaShoah, the Holocaust Memorial Day. The purpose of Yom HaShoah is to commemorate the loss of six million Jews, nearly half of the Jews in the world at that time, and many others who were murdered at the hands of the Nazis. It's traditional on the anniversary of a close relative's death to light a candle, much like the one that I have here, that lasts 24 hours. The yellow, the candle is yellow because of the Jews under Nazi rule, were required to wear a yellow armband with a Jewish star. This program, candle program, was developed in 1981 by one of our men's clubs in Peabody, Massachusetts. Each year, we distribute tens of thousands of yellow candles. We invite our synagogues and churches to purchase candles and participate in that commemoration. As we do on Yom HaShoah, on Martin Luther King Day, we honor the memories of victims of those who lost their lives at the hands of evil. On Holocaust Memorial Day, we, honor, we also honor the, the righteous Gentiles, people like Raoul Wallenberg, a Swedish diplomat who saved the lives of many Jews. In a similar way, on Martin Luther King Day, we honor those who risked the lives sitting at lunch counters, and those who stood up to injustice at demonstrations in support of civil rights. On Yom HaShoah, we pledge to remember those who were murdered by the Nazis, as today we remember those who suffered under the tyranny of in injustice and those who fought for civil rights. Today we honor the memory of Martin Luther King Jr., and we rededicate ourselves to fulfilling his dream of bringing freedom and equality to all. So it's an honor and a pleasure to be here in Temple Bethamuna. It's 
uh, looks the same as the place I was this morning at 8 o'clock for the jazz service. But, uh, welcome to Temple Bethany. My name is Steve Bernard. I'm the president of the Brockton Area Branch of the NAACP. First of all, I want to thank everyone who came out to, to yesterday's 30th Martin Luther King Jr. breakfast, where we heard uh, the Reverend Brandon Crowley. I want to thank Bishop Tony Branch for uh, being the MC for the day. I think he moved the program right along in a, in a very celebratory manner. And to thank, of course, our own uh, Sharon Molden for being our entertainment and blessing us with her powerful, powerful voice. Those who were there, I, I know, uh, enjoyed the morning, and I thank you all for coming. And I encourage each and every one of you to come out uh, next year and support your largest civil rights organization in the country, the NAACP. Steve Weiner, in the beginning of the program, uh, <clears throat> mentioned that I'd be uh, speaking about Black Lives Matter. But from a different perspective today, because the Black Lives Matter that we are going to be talking about today is appealing to you and appealing to our brothers to help save our brothers' lives. Ladies and gentlemen, in the United States, one out of seven of all men die from prostate cancer. Of all the forms of discrimination and of equalities, of inequalities, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. Martin Luther King, March 25th, 1966, at an annual meeting of the Medical Center, the Medical Committee of uh, Human Rights. Prostate cancer discriminates. Black men die at a rate of two times, two and a half times that of white men. Remember, one in seven of all men in the United States die from prostate cancer, two and a half times that of white men and black men's death. In Massachusetts, the mortality rate, the death rate, is 2.62 times higher in, the Af in African Americans versus white men. In Plymouth County, and you all know we're here in Plymouth County, for black men, prostate cancer mortality is 66% higher than the state average. In Brockton, in black men, the prostate cancer mortality rate is 39% higher than the state average. The Brockton area in ACP has established a prostate cancer awareness team to expand awareness and education and create a high impact, sustainable, and ongoing program. We are partnering with Admi Tech Foundation, and on yesterday afternoon, the NAACP, Admi Tech, and Good Samaritan Medical Center presented our first Prostate Cancer Awareness Day. There were educational presentations, there was a session for question and answers, and there was a session for individual and group consultation. I invite you all to join us in this effort to save our brothers' lives. Black lives matter, but it is the responsibility of, all, of us all to take responsibility and empower ourselves to take care of our own health. When at 40 years of age and older, you must have your PSA blood test uh, tested at least once every two years, preferably every, every year. Empower ourselves. Black Lives Matter, let's start with empowering ourselves and make certain that our medical professionals are giving us the tests that we need to, be, to, to make certain that our lives will be prolonged. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an appeal to you. This is not just for black men. This is for families. If our black men, if our men are dying, our families are affected. It's a civil rights matter. You know, doctors are not going to give you the test, in many cases, unless you ask for it. However, the disparity of white men, white men versus black men dying is growing. It's getting wider. It's a civil rights matter. 
we need to take care of ourselves. All of us need to make certain that we take care of our men's lives, we take care of our families, we take care of each other. Why? Because we all love one another. With that, I ask you to bless this day. And remember that God loves you. Thank you very much. I said this is a village and we have a visiting dignitary today <laughs> and therefore we bring a talent before you as a gift of thanksgiving that you've come to visit us and so for the moment we're going to turn to a part of our program prior to our speaker and the person who will introduce her to a little segment of honoring her with talent and arts and we have the Back in Town Quartet with Rabbi David Grossman. And then following that, we'll have a delivery of a tradition for this event, which is a poem called Standing Tall. And uh, we, are, we have Frank A. Shepton and Chanel Tucker who will uh, present that to us. And following that, Duke Bud Drums will come. Uh, David Kaipu will do what drumming does, which is to prepare for a speaker and to clear the air. So I invite the uh, Back in Town Quartet to share with us. Thank you.
someone in the grave somewhere somewhere hears every word every time I hear a newborn baby cry or touch a President of Endowed Theatre Company of New England, and this is my daughter Chanel. Some kings rule through their, their kingdoms, sitting down, surrounded by luxury, soft cushions, and fans. But this king sits strong, sit proud of his tall. When the driver told Rosa, moves to the back of the bus. When the waiter told the students, we don't serve your time. When the mayor told the voters, your vote don't count. And when the sheriff told the marchers, get off our street. Using fire hoses, police dogs, cattle prods to move them along, this king stood strong. Sit proud and sit tall. Speaking of peace, of love and children, hand in hand, free at last. Free at last. Oh, when some yelled for violence, for angry revenge, and an eye for an eye. And a tooth for a tooth, he stood his ground, preaching peace. And when some spit out hate, he, he stood there silent. Speaking love, until it rolled like the sea across the land. Sweeping away Jim Crow, breaking down the wall. Ringing the bell joyfully. For freedom. Until standing on the mountaintop. They shot him. Coldly hoping to see him fall. Hoping to put him away, to bring him low. But this king, even in death. Even today, stands strong. Stands proud. Stands still. And, and we see. remember.
does, so I invite Herb Jones to come. Pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. I'll turn it over to Steve now, but thanks to everyone. <laughs> In April of 1968, in Dr. King's final speech before he was murdered, he spoke of getting to the mountaintop and seeing the promised land. What did he say? When speaking to Reverend Irene, as she likes to be called, she said something very interesting you got in Bayard Rustin. Sometimes a sheep can stray from the flock. It is hard to fathom here in the 21st century that there was a time that African Americans were not part of that flock. Dr. King knew that the road to his dream in the promised land would be slow and rocky, but he saw good things like members of Temple Beth Amuna and members of Messiah Baptist Church working together last night, preparing and setting up together. <coughs> I hope Messiah realizes, I hope Messiah realizes that what a jewel you have in Sharon Mulder. I know that I do. <laughs> what we have done in 20 years of this program is not to forget the injustices in our history, but also to learn how many were overcome. Brockton is a microcosm of the beloved community that Dr. King spoke of. There is always work to be done a program like today's is a good start. As Emma Christ asked us, why should we overcome someday? How about today? <laughs> That's right. It is an honor to welcome back home an old friend of Messiah Baptist Church and an old friend of Temple Beth Amuna, Herb Jones, who will introduce our keynote speaker. <laughs> I've never spoken to monkey before, right? <laughs> so this is, this is a weird vantage place for me right now. Um, I want to start, first of all, thank you, Steve, and yes. thank you, Reverend Jill, for inviting me to participate in this, um, in this program today. Um, and I think I want to start by asking Sister Paulette Walker if she's still here and Dr. Thea James to just stand or wave your hands because um, personally, I consider you to, you know, I think it was Maya Angelou who wrote the poem, had the poem, Phenomenal Women. And I count the two of you as two incredibly phenomenal women. <laughs> because you are each married to two of the most radically authentic people that I have ever met in my life. And to hold down that role makes you phenomenal women. <laughs> um, it is indeed a pleasure and an honor to introduce to some of you and to present to others of you who may be somewhat familiar with her, Dr. Irene Monroe. I first encountered uh, Dr. Monroe probably about 13, 14 years ago. Uh, when I first, right around the time I first joined the Biden Rustin Breakfast Committee for AIDS Action in Boston. And I will be very honest with you to say that at that time, uh, Reverend Monroe scared me a little bit. Um, to quote one of, my, one of my favorite singers that she used to introduce one of her songs, Nancy Wilson used to say that in order for a, a man to have the kind of woman at home who she sang about, and guess who I saw today? She said, you had to have somebody who was patient and kind and forgiving and sweet and naive and all of those things. And she said, and I can be all of those things but never on the same day. <laughs> Um, but what has always impressed me about Reverend I Irene Monroe is that she has never been afraid to embrace all of her intersections. Her role, her, her being as a woman, her being as a black woman, her being 
as a, as a queer or, or lesbian woman, her role, her being a Christian, her being a person of faith, her being an activist, she embraces all of those. And that's, that's not easy for a lot of us in this society to accept. <coughs> But I am reminded of uh, a book I read when I first started out in music. And you know, I, it, it simply said that it was encouraging people. It's one thing to be, to want to be uh, a national figure, you know, to be the great, uh, you know, the next Michael Jordan, or in my case, the next James Cleveland, or whoever. Um, but the best work that you can do is to, to be authentic in your hometown. Because, and what the author pointed out, he said, you know, people can see, you know, the big, the big, the Kirk Franklins or those people, but the people who, when they see you on Sunday and then they see you in the grocery store, or they run into you at the barber shop or the hair salon, um, that's where what you do makes the biggest impact on people. And so having the opportunity to run into Reverend Monroe in all kinds of places, right around Boston, and see her still being the same person that she is when she's being interviewed in an internationally released documentary, or, or when she's being interviewed in, in Oprah magazine, or when she's, being, when she's speaking on behalf of her at Harvard University, or writing papers on behalf of Harvard. That's what made the impact on me. That's what has allowed me to become stronger in, being, in living in all of my intersections. So, um, I don't think that was all of what you wanted me to say, <laughs> but um, I thank you for, I thank you Steve for, for inviting Reverend Monroe. She's a great choice, yeah. a great selection, and so I encourage you to just take in what she says. Don't, don't be afraid of it. You know, some of it might come back to you next week, next month. Um, but trust me, it's all relevant and it, it, it's all true, okay? So to those of you today here, blessed and privileged, I present to you Reverend Dr. Irene Monroe. See, that's the problem. Uh, when you're all over town and he'll catch you uh, when you're in Whole Foods <laughs> on the subway here. Thank you so much for uh, a truthful, I must say, an introduction here. Um, I thank you so much for having me as your speaker uh, this Sunday here. It is just a pleasure to be here. You know, being here today reminded me of how this moment doesn't hold true, this statement, that the most segregated hour in America is Sunday, because the, co the coming together of two different faiths belies that we can be this beloved community. So I thank you. I thank you that I should say I have witnessed that. Absolutely have witnessed that. I want to thank Reverend Jill here and Steve, and um, I have to just signify a little bit about my colleague, the Reverend Michael here. Mike, you know, one of the things you um, always are concerned about when you're in seminary, will you land and find a church? And I want to say, I'm proud of you. You have done well. And the generosity, the generosity, I'm not surprised of how you use this space and how all are welcome because uh, at, in seminary, he was always very, very, not only embracing of all people, but very generous even with his notes, <laughs> he made his, his class notes. He may not remember that, because that's two decades ago. And, uh, and you've gotten older, you're still handsome, and he may suffer with what I call this here, that I always say that, you know, uh, life is short and my memory is shorter, so you may not remember that, but I remember the notes you gave me. So thank you so very, very much here and stuff. It's delighted just to absolutely be here. The Yoruba proverb states this, if we stand tall, it's because we stand on the backs of those who came before us. My African ancestors taught us how to make it in those broken places, and they have taught us how to make a way out of no way. 
They have taught us that we must lift as we climb, and they have also taught us that we must always see our work in relationship to one another. It is an honor to be here this afternoon. I know no words eloquent enough to express the deep meaning and great power of knowing that tomorrow this nation will be celebrating the 30th anniversary of MLK Day. I gotta give you a bit of history here because this is when I say God works in mysterious ways. Or better yet, there's some good in just everybody. <laughs> President Ronald Reagan, remember back walking in the valley of death and I will fear no evil? Sign this holiday into law in 18, I uh, eight, well, it feels like that, <laughs> uh, 1983, and it was first obser observed in 1986. Like many of you gathered here this afternoon, I am bound, committed, and humbled by the words and teachings of Martin Luther King. And like so many, I too stand on King's shoulders. Our job in keeping King's dream alive is to be part of a participatory government that is working to dismantle the existing, existing discriminatory laws that truncate full participation in the fight to advance democracy, not for some people, but for all the people. And our job in keeping King's dream alive is about social justice work. It's about healing ourselves <coughs> about personal bigotry, biases, and demons that chip away at our good intent to do social work. And it's also about moral leadership. So part of moral leadership is upholding King's philosophy, the beloved community. And there's this African proverb that says this, it takes a village to raise a child. I would be remiss and not asking the village of Brockton and all the surrounding towns that as we celebrate this King holiday, we remember and hold in prayer a young man named Zach Seidlinger, a senior, an honor high school student who happened to be sitting in his kitchen last Monday and a bullet struck him. And we have to do this. And I'm not here to make a statement about gun control, but we have to do it because the moral strength in any community is to make everyone safe, especially our children. And everyone here today, I invite you in this challenge. And speaking about moral leadership, moral leadership, because we talk about King, and, and some of you might be disappointed that I'm not gonna talk about King today. You will hear enough about King, not only today and tomorrow, but I wanted just to talk a little different today about the Civil Rights Movement. M moral leadership is not agenda specific nor centered around one person. For example, both Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. were leaders of the Montgomery Bus Boys Club in 1954. And I always have to tell people this because they don't sometimes understand the interconnectedness between Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, but I say this, had Rosa Parks not sat down, King could not have gotten up. <laughs> and had Bayard Rustin not walked into King's life in the 1950s, it would not have been what we now know as that historic 1963 March on Washington. As the strategist and chief architect of the march, Rustin catapulted King onto a national stage. He brought Gandhi uh, protest techniques to the American black civil rights movement. And he helped mold King into the international symbol of peace and nonviolence. I'm, I was always taught that you must always never forget the bridge that carries you across. Memory is such that what we do here on King's holiday, we dishonor all the folks, the foot soldiers, the folks seen and not seen in the movement. 
We forget about the Fannie Lou Hamers. Yeah. Oh my. We know John Lewis. And we and remember a few other people, but we forget these important people. And Rosa Parks, we, we remember her a little more. But the, but the a movement is not always about the person that is the figure or of the movement, but it's always those people unseen, the people whose lives are lost and we don't remember. As a matter of fact, in talking about Bayard Rustin, uh, in February of 1956, when, when Bayard arrived in Montgomery to assist the bus boycott, Martin Luther King had not personally embraced nonviolence. In fact, there were guns inside King's yeah. house uh, and armed guards to protect him. Despite these achievements, Rustin was silent, threatened, arrested, beaten, imprisoned, and fired from important leadership positions, largely because of his sexual orientation, that of an openly gay man in a fiercely homophobic area. We would like to think that that's back in the day, but truth be told, we are as homophobic today as we, are, we were back in the 1950s. Uh, we just call it now being on the down low. One of the interesting things here, I appreciate Reverend Michael sharing with me. He, someone asked uh, from the congregation here, she's sitting here, and she said, oh, you know, I'm, I, um, I didn't know much about the Bible. I grew up Catholic. I'm not holding that against Catholics, because if you grow up back to college, you can't help but know Bible, you know, verse in Bible here. And she said, I didn't know there was an apocryphal text. And I said, oh, there's, a and she said, what is that? And I said, on the down low. And, and the reason I say that, because there are a lot of stuff on the down low in the Bible that we don't talk about. And so one of the things about that I appreciate that my, that Reverend Michael said is that he brings the down low up front and center. So I hope, I hope this evening to bring someone who's been on force historically on the down low, which is Bayard Rustin. Who is Bayard Rustin? Well, I would say he's a man of courage, one of our sort of tallest trees in our forest. Born in 1912 in the Quaker settled area of Westchester, Pennsylvania, one of the stops, I must tell you, of the Underground Railroad is where Bayard Rustin's beginnings are. A handsome six-footer who possessed both athletic and academic prowess, Rustin was the quintessential outsider. A black man, a Quaker, a pacifist, a political and social dissident, and as black folks say, a homosexual. <laughs> Rustin was always an outcast because he affirmed his sexuality long before it became popular to come out, in, out of the closet. He would stood attacks from the FBI. from the FBI, Southern segregationists, anti-communists, and yes, even leaders of the black religious community, like New York Councilman Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. In the civil rights movement, Bayard Rustin was always the man behind the scenes, largely because of the fact that he was openly gay. And because of their own homophobia, Many African-American ministers like Adam Clayton Powell involved in the movement would have nothing to do with Bayard Rustin 
And they would in, they said they would intentionally rumor that get, that King was also gay because of his association. I like to think I like to think that. Um, and I'm not here to trash that black church because one of the things I have to say as a child of the black church is that with, with, with family members, uh, we, we, we all have different opinions. Uh, the one thing I have to say about the black church, and I will say that many are homophobic, uh, and many of them need to work on this issue. It is still within a society where racism is as rampant today as it was in the killing, in my opinion, of Emmett Till, yeah. uh, and that the only difference between Emmett Till's era and my era is because we got camcorders, that's it, and, 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 and smartphones to record it. But that in a society that is as racist as it is, as it was then, as it is today, uh, the church is the only place. It's a refuge in a time of trouble. And as a family, we know our family. They will not agree, not understand, will argue, but Amen. they will always take us in. Amen. They will do a theological qualified to say that uh, they, lo they love the sinner, but hate the sin. But they will always take us in. They will deny, they will deny that this is not just a white dis disease, that it's been going on long before, long before black folks began coming out. And, and they also will know this, you really can't have good black gospel music without at least one, if not a whole lot of gay men. Now, say amen. And shame the devil. Come on and tell the truth. And tell the truth. So I'm not here. I'm really not here to dog the black church uh, about its homophobia. I'm just trying to remind you of it and others of other kinds of ills that we carry in the name of Jesus as good Christians as law-abiding citizens. But Babe Rustin was my hero, as it was for many of us, because that was the only hero we had in, in that came out of the Civil Rights Movement. So many of you will always tease out this question, and I wrote a piece that's on Huffington Post, and you can go to it if you like, and you can disagree with it, and, and you can even walk out after I make this statement, because Herb already said I was dangerous. <laughs> So, so people have always said, would King, would King have stood up for gay marriage? So the truth is, all right, and I, I can take my seat and sit down after. But the truth is, no, he would not have. Not in the historical context. We have to understand King within the historical context that he comes out of. So let's talk a little bit about the historical context that King comes out of. It is the 1960s. It, the church is homophobic, but also we have to realize as much as we laud King here, we have to realize that women took a back seat in the movement, and now you know, many decades later that has come out. We have to also realize that as King was, was moving off of the national stage, another kind of black activism was taking place, and that was called the Black Power Movement. We also have to realize that King also, because he wasn't a single issue kind of person, he understood the interconnections of oppressions, that he was also not only talking about racism, but he was also talking about the Vietnam War. And he was talking about poverty. And although we like to say the Kennedys are a friend to black folks, the real friend was LBJ. But as good as he was, but as good as he was, he wanted to keep King tethered to a rope. And King spoke out, so he lost favor with the LGBT community that was underground in supporting him. He lost favor with the African American militant community. And he lost favor with, LGB, with um, Lyndon uh, B. Johnson, who signed the 1964 Civil Rights Act. 
So King was quite radical in his day. But as radical as he was in his day, he would not have stood up in that era, in that time, for gay rights. And for a couple of reasons. He had to disassociate himself with Bay and Rustin in order to move forward. Would I call King homophobic? Not at all. Not at all, because we have to really understand that while we're trying to lift everybody, we can't always at the same time. And so King did what he had to do. He really did. He really did. Um, push Bayard Rustin to the sideline. But I never thought that the history books would do the same. So I'm here today to lift up one of our heroes. I was very glad that at least by the time we got into 1990, Rosa Parks. Uh, was lifted up. I'm hoping that we will learn a little more about Fannie Lou Hamer. I'm hoping, you know, that we will learn a little more about a number of people that were in the civil rights movement. But one of the things that 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 Bay and Rustin teaches us is this: that 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 oppressions cannot be seen in a competing order. And what do I mean by this? We can't, as black people, assume that we have a patent on oppression. We, as black people, can't assume we have no homosexuals in our community. That sounds like the president of Iran like, said that we had none. But white people can't assume that because you have one good white friend, or black friend, or maybe, maybe no friend, but at least one good black friend, you're not racist. So one of the things that I always have to say to folks when they say that they're about justice and they're about civil rights, I always say this here, that if King and Rustin were among us today, they would say this, it's not enough to just look outside of ourselves and see the places where society is broken. And it's not enough to talk about institutions, workplaces, universities, and churches that fracture and separate people from one another based on race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, and I can go on without us not looking at ourselves. So what do I mean by this? We must also look at the ways in which we ourselves, we ourselves, uphold these bigotries and how we uphold these institutions in the workplace, in the church. And one of the things I realized, I don't, I, I'm not talking about this church, but I had pastored a number of churches. I used to always wonder, how come some of the most meanest people sit up in the church? I used to always try to figure out, and sometimes the meanest people would put in the most money so they had control over many of the auxiliaries in the church. But they would say, I love Jesus, but hate the parishioners sitting beside them. So if we're going to talk about healing these places, these workplaces, these universities, these churches, we need to heal ourselves. If we think, if we think our workplace is crazy, we might need to realize it's because we are crazy. <laughs> we can't not heal, we can't heal the world. See, it's wonderful, you're gonna come up in here, we're gonna talk about King, you're gonna say I said a little something, something about Dave Rustin, okay? And you're gonna leave here with your six cells. You cannot heal the world if you have not healed yourself. So the greatest work and the most difficult work that must be done in light of the teachings of the civil rights movement, the foremothers and the forefathers, is to heal yourself. I always love this scripture and the Luke text. As we know, Luke was, was a physician. He says, physician, he says, to, he says, what did he say? Phys to heal yourself. Physician, heal yourself. And, it, and it's this work that must be done in relationship to our social justice work, not only in our neighborhoods, in our workplace, but out in the world. Ernest Hemingway, in his novel, and I need to tell you this, so I, I, I don't like Ernest Hemingway, 
I think, it, with, without a doubt, the, the, the record shows that he was bigoted, he was racist, he was homophobic. And so you would like to say, well, you know, why use him? And to me, it just proves the point that there's some good in everybody. And in that moment, Ernest Hemingway, in Farewell to Arms, said this, the world breaks us all, but some of us grow strong in those broken places. I believe God wants us to grow strong in our broken places, not only to mend the sin-sick world that we live in, but also to mend that sin-sick world we carry within ourselves. And we can only do it if we both look inward and outward, healing ourselves of our personal bigotry, biases, and demons that chip, chip away at our good intent to do social justice work. So it's easy, right? It's, it's sort of easy to sort of sort of lob onto the language of social justice. And it's real easy to say that I pause every, 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 what is it, King Holiday, you know, to give honor to this man. And it reminds me of white people who say this, and I know it, they love King, but afraid of black brothers. Yeah. You know, uh, they'll, they'll love King, but, but, but don't think that those who have money, that you know, the money that you're spending to send a brother to jail, could be spent to educate him. Or, 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 or a city that says, I like diversity, but does window sort of cosmetic surgery here, so upholding the same sort of ideology. If we're gonna talk about diversity, we gotta also talk about power. And if we gotta talk about power, which Black Lives Matter, you know, Black Lives Matter movement is talking about, then we gotta talk about who holds the power. White people, right? Let's be truthful. Let's be truthful, okay? So if we're going to talk about changing and healing ourselves, I just want, just, you know, and this is black, this is, I know this is not just black church, but this is black church and, and, and synagogue together. But we, we do in black church, you know, we do call and response. I just want to do one, I just want those people here who are white. And, that's, and let me identify that or, or clarify that. You put it on the senses. You don't pay. You don't pay the black tax. You can drive while white, jog while white, shop while white. You can be white. So those people who fit that category, could you just raise your hand? All right. You are white people. But I got a charge for black folks too. Don't you worry about it. Don't you worry about it. But I got to set it up in the right chronological order. I just want you to leave with two questions today. If you ponder this even for 30 minutes, I bless you. If, if you walk out here and you remember the questions, I bless you. Because it is in your memory for all the days of your white life. This is it. How are you white, and how white are you? All right? How are you white, and how white are you? You cannot do justice work as white people trying to be allies to us black folks and not know that answer. All right? How are you white? Oh, it's very simple. It's very simple. It's a construction. You got white skin privilege. But how white are you? Well, I'll give you an example of that. I did a workshop once on anti-racism, and a white woman raised her hand when we got to this segment of the workshop, and she said, well, I'm not as white as I used to be. I said, well, tell me a little bit about that. And she said, because my daughter married a black man. And I said, well, clearly white women are black men's kryptonite. You are not as white as you used to be, but truth be told, a whole lot of white folk have been dipping in chocolate. Your daughter is not the only one. <laughs> but when I get to the second question, because I really want you to leave here changed. I really want you to leave here changed, okay? In honor 
uh, because I just feel like white folks have been on the down low about their white skin privilege, okay? I think you've been a little queer about that, okay? I really, I really, really do. And when I see this year's election and, and, and I see folks that come out uh, for certain, certain candidates, I know, you, I know you angry. You've been angry. I just, just don't know why they have demonized people who look like me when we get angry. But I know you've been angry. I know you've been angry because you feel bereft of the American dream. But this, when I ask this question, just, you know, how white are you? I'm asking you, when did you get your white card? I'm asking you, when did the Italians become white? When did the Jews become white? When did the Irish become white? You see, because in buying into this notion, what I call the conceptual trap of whiteness, you have given up your white ethnicity for this notion of whiteness. And what happens is, is that when we think of ethnicity, we have always coded that to mean people of color. Yeah. But, but when I'm asking you this is that when you don't know your history, you become dangerous. What does that look like? Appropriating black culture and then claiming it as yours. What does that look like? Racial Dolazar, who can just switch, switch, be the, N, be the president of the NAACP in Spokane, Virginia, because she just decided one day to wake up and All said, right. I, I want to be black. Okay? Now, I could do the same thing. Wake up one day and say, I want to be white, but it won't be convincing. <laughs> I, could, I, could even, I could even try to talk white. Yes, yes. There is, there is talking white, and it's not talking about inarticulation, I'm talking about the tenor of our voices are very, very different. And there's nothing wrong with that. I love the fact that when people hear me, they'll say, oh, she's so articulate, but I know she's a sister, and you got that right. <laughs> so, so, my charge to you, as white people, just, just leave today with those two questions. How are you white? Work on that. How white are you? Okay, and then when you deconstruct power, just in micro ways, how, how have you used your power to maintain your white skin privilege? Mm -hmm. You'll be surprised. See, because what you forget is that when you too were considered second class citizens, and truth be told, as broke as many white people are, I think the whole country is colored at this point. <laughs> but, but as I said, Black folks ain't getting off the hook either, all right? I really understand the politic of respectability in our African-American community. I really do understand that given the iconography of black bodies and images in our society from Sambo to now Hoochie Mama to whatever we see in these videos, I understand why we have not given voice to black, not only respectability, but the different type of people who are in our community. I understand that in trying to keep our images out of a white gaze, we have lost language how to define ourselves and to understand ourselves. Okay. And in so doing, we have turned on ourselves, as what I say, participated in our own oppression on each other. So while today, we may not have to deal with issues of light skin and dark skin, not in, the, not in the way that we certainly had to do back in the day and have this brown paper bag in order to have an entrance into a black university. We have other ways of testing what we call black authenticity. You can't be a feminist and be black. You can't be gay and be black. But it's all right to say that, you know, I'm a rapper and black. I, you can't be educated and be black. You can't be Republican and be black. Well, maybe not. But, <laughs> but, but you get my point. But my question is this, is that the black community really do have to work on its homophobia. So let me give you an example of this. We like to say in our community, because we like to say a whole lot of stuff, but we like to say this. We don't throw our kids away. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We throw 
our gay, our lesbian, our bisexual, and transgender children on the street. And if we are going to change that, I look to black mothers to do so. Because I like to believe that no black mother wants their child in harm's way, no matter who and how they come into the world, because they didn't ask to be born. So my challenge to, 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 um, to the black community, you gotta work on this. The AIDS epidemic is ravishing our community. We got ministers on the down low, like Eddie, Eddie Long, okay, who could have done more service by being out than being in the closet. We got children, we don't like to talk about that, killing themselves because they don't fit this elusive paradigm called blackness. And how dare we be so limited in how we define ourselves? Slavery is over. Why are we doing this to ourselves? So I want to leave here with this message, that yes, we should uphold King's legacy, but we should not forget the others. And yes, we very much, we very much want to live in this beloved community that King talks about. But I say this, that before we do this, I want you to, and everyone, white, black, and of different ethnicities, and. And, and different sexual orientations and gender, that we must really embrace the Kwanzaa principle of Ujima, meaning unity. We must take root in our self-understanding of who we are and what we decide to be as a people, a community, and as activists. And the understanding, the, and understanding the interconnectedness between himself, the individual, and himself as the community African historian John Mbutu said this, I am because we are, and since we are, therefore I am. But my cautionary note is this, in our effort to do anti-oppression work on ourselves, on ourselves, that the infighting that goes on in our community is really a symptom of what's broken within ourselves. So I ask you this, in the face of our own self-respect, the fighting among us must stop. The distrust among us must stop. The competitiveness among us must stop. In our reverence for King, Rustin, and others of the Civil Rights Movement, let us remember that our longing for social justice should also be the longing for personal healing. We have come here this Sunday afternoon holding on to a vision because our life's work is bent on helping others and it is arched towards justice. Let us see that it is today that our best work can be done and must be done in the face of our own self-respect. Let us see that it is today with the teachings of the civil rights movement that we fit ourselves for a greater tomorrow and that that greater usefulness for tomorrow is to look at the world and ourselves from an involved, committed stance and light of a faith that does justice. Let us be united in this journey. Let us speak in harmony of a common goal. Common be our prayer. Common be our resolution. Pro common be our intention. But united be our hearts and perfect, please, perfect, be our unity. Thank you.
making it to the Bay of Records, right? Well, that's one. Okay. The A's actually. Well, if you have been someplace today, and we, our little settlement has been taught by a wise teacher. And uh, in this age of technology, I like handmade things. And so uh, we have little lights, tea lights, in these African uh, little parcels that each of you can take as you go there outside. And, uh, if shining a light is what we have felt today in our village that will now disperse, then as you carry this, know that uh, the healing can begin, and do it very safely, put it in a container <laughs> as you unwrap it, but they're there for you to take to carry away from our time together because we are dispersed. And so I invite Pastor Louis Lemieux of Love Alliance Church, which is located in downtown Brockton, and every second Sunday, they don't have church church, they go out and have church, and they do something that will help somebody else. And we hope all of us do that. Absolutely. Please pray with me. When I first came to Brockton years ago, there was a summer where nine young people were shot and killed over the course of the summer. And I found myself this week, and I thank you, Reverend Monroe, for uh, bringing this up. I found myself falling asleep and praying late at night once again for a young man to survive the night who simply went into his kitchen to get a glass of water. I've been here enough years where I say, you know, when, when will that end? When will there come a year where I'm not praying for a young person to survive the night? I look at Dr. King and I, I can see an amazing writer. I'm inspired by his civil disobedience, inspired by the many people he inspired to follow him and serve under him, the foot soldiers that Dr. Monroe spoke of. But I'm most inspired by the preacher who in Montgomery got down on his knees and prayed to God and said, we need justice in this city. And for 2016, I seek to do the same, and I hope our city does the same. That we get on our knees and say, Lord, bring justice to the city of Brockton. May we be inspired, like Dr. King, to do whatever it takes to bring justice to our city. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. song that we all know as children and as grown-ups and as you depart and we join together in singing this little light of mine and please feel free to uh, meet and greet with uh, Reverend Monroe as we go from this place but let's just start a little chant. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. 